Okay, thank you for joining everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Northern Kentucky History Hour. I'm your host for tonight, Heather Cook. Northern Kentucky, Northern Kentucky History Hour is a project of Barringer Crawford Museum, Northern Kentucky's History Museum. Barringer Crawford Museum is supported in part by the City of Covington, Kentucky County Fiscal Court, Arts Wave, Kentucky Arts Council, Northern Kentucky Sports Hall of Fame, the Carol Ann and Ralph B. Hale Jr. U.S. Bank Foundation and our members. If you're not yet a member of the museum, please con consider joining for access to discounts, exclusive programming, learn more and join at bcmuseum.org. Before we begin, let's go over a few reminders. Everyone's microphone has been muted so that we can all focus on the presentation. Feel free to turn off your video. You can also leave it on if you prefer but people can see you on the call even if the screen is being shared. If you have a question or comment to share, please type it in the chat feature and uh, we will try to get to all of them before the presentation is over. Um, also, there will be a quiz question tonight. The first um, respondent to enter a correct answer in the chat uh, will win a Northern Kentucky History Hour pin. Um, let's start with tonight's speaker, Paul A. Tenkati. Um, has authored and edited 14 books, contributed chapters to eight additional books, and written hundreds of articles for a wide range of publications. They include Cincinnati, the Queen City, 225th Anniversary Edition with Dan Hurley, the Encyclopedia of Northern, Ken Northern Kentucky with James Claypool, Gateway City, Covington, Kentucky, 1850-15 to 2015, in a textbook, The United States Since 1865, Information Literacy and Critical Thinking. Tenkati has been a contributor to 16 television documentaries, including PBS's 10 That Changed America, Engineering Marvels, award-winning productions include Sacred Spaces of Greater Cincinnati, and Where, Where the River Bends, A History of Northern Kentucky. He serves as a professor of history at Northern Kentucky University and edits the weekly Our Rich History column for the Northern Kentucky um, Tribune. Paul, welcome. Thank you very much. I'm going to go over and start sharing my screen. And so here we go. Let's see here. Share. All right. Can everyone see that OK? Are we looking good, Heather? Yeah, you look great. All right, wonderful. So this is entitled, You'd Be Home Now, Park Hills, Kentucky. What in the world? What kind of a heading is that, a title is that? Well, it's, it's stolen, it's plagiarized from a sign that's still up. It's been, it was repainted a few years ago, and it stands there on Dixie Highway on one of the entrances to Park Hills. And it always had that uh, little guy there looking very relaxed, smoking his pipe at home after a hard day at work. All right. Well, the first couple of things we're going to talk about is what that all means. What does home really mean? And, and of course, my own home, I was born in Covington at a hospital and raised in Park Hills, Kentucky. Here's a, a, a uh, all modesty aside, adorable picture of me at not even three years old in March, 1963. And this is the house that uh, I grew up in. And as my dad used to say, and it came from a song of the day in the 1960s uh, that we grew up and we lived in a ticky tacky house. So, um, and proud of it, by the way. So uh, there were a series of houses that looked exactly alike, except they reversed the floor plans, changed the brick color, changed the other colors. And so it was typical, these houses dated from 1957. Home was a very important idea in the 1920s and 30s and 40s as the city of Park Hills or the suburb of Park Hills developed. The idea of owning a home during the first part of the 20th century, during the 1920s and 30s, et cetera, became really the American dream. It really wasn't an American dream to own a home in the 1800s. 
most people, many people could not really afford owning a home and never really got out of renting a home or renting an apartment. Um, Paul, just yeah. so you know, your uh, slide is still on the opening slide. It's still on the opening slide. Okay. I am so sorry. Okay, so now let's see what it did. Has it progressed? It has not. It has not. All right. Let's figure this out. How about now? Nope. I may need to change the screen then here. And I apologize. We will change the screen. We even practiced this, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay, let's try this. How about that? Are you seeing the second screen now? We are now. All right, thank you very much. Um, so anyhow, the other thing that we really need to talk about is convenience. Why Park Hills and when was it developed? So it was actually developed by two men and the first of those men was named DeWitt Collins Lee. He attended the rugby school in Covington, which is down on, was down on St Sanford Street. It's been since made into condos and you see it right down here in the lower left-hand corner. He then went on for his AB, that's really what we call a BA degree these days, at Center College in Kentucky, in Danville, Kentucky, and he eventually became an attorney. Now, the thing that we know about D. Collins Lee that is worth saying is he was very much a believer in many of the progressive ideals, you know, those ideals of the progressive era of the early 20th century. And one of those ideals was for a planning and zoning commission for the city of Covington, which he actually chaired from like 1928 to 1937. And he also, besides being an attorney, was involved in developing a couple of subdivisions. The first of those was Park Hills, but also uh, what was called Barrington Woods and the old city of Lookout Heights, which is now part of Fort Wright. So if you're trying to place where Barrington Woods is now, um, if uh, you're familiar at all with I-75 and with the Kyle's Lane exit, uh, Barrington Woods was actually right behind what a, where there are a lot of gas stations and a little kind of shopping center now. It's in the vicinity of Park Road. Um, and both of these communities developed along what was then the Green Line. And the Green Line was a streetcar system. Now, D. Collins Lee, when he developed Park Hills, you know, involved um, architects and planners. So what we're going to especially study tonight is how well designed the city of Park Hills was. He built his own home using architect C.F. Solarius of Cincinnati at the end of Emerson Road, and that home still stands in, um, in Park Hills. Now, one of the things that I want to say here that's very important is notice that even though he lived outside the city of Covington, he actually served on the Covington and was chair of the Covington Planning and Zoning Commission for quite a number of years. And that is because the Covington Planning and Zoning Commission was set up by the state to serve Covington and the immediate suburbs around it. Now, when I bring up the term zoning, you probably are all familiar with that. But back in the early 20th century, in the 19 teens and 20s, zoning was still a fairly new thing in the United States. In fact, one of the first places to have zoning in the United States in terms of having a regular zoning law that applied across the board to a city 
was New York City, and that was in 1916. 1916. And at that point, a, a lot of other people were um, saying, well, we really don't like the idea of zoning. It seems to be that local government is overstepping its bounds. So eventually it took about 10 years for this to work its way up to the Supreme Court. And in 1926, the US Supreme Court approved uh, zoning and that local cities and municipalities could have planning and zoning commissions. So we're gonna go to the next uh, slide here. And I, the other uh, partner in developing the subdivision and that led, then it became city of uh, Park Hills was Robert Burt Simmons. He was also an attorney and he married Alma Lawton. Uh, their old family home, the Simmons old family home, was located at 1300 Amsterdam Road. So right at the corner of what is now Amsterdam, Amsterdam Road and um, uh, uh, Altavia. And Altavia, by the way, is, is uh, uh, all, means Alta Via, highest road, Altavia. Um, the new home that they would build, which is shown here in a brochure of 1927-28 of Park Hills, the Simmons home would be on Lawton Road, and Lawton Road was, of course, named after his wife's family. When they began to develop the subdivision, it was in 1924, and they issued um, plats, which, of course, uh, were recorded at the Kenton County Clerk's Office in Covington, Kentucky. Uh, this shows one of those plats, and they were also, of course, recorded in deed books. Now, what I want you to kind of notice is this new system of developing subdivisions in the 19-teens and 20s. In fact, it went, it went back to even earlier times in the 1800s, but was just beginning to be popular nationwide. These are the kind of suburbs that were designed with the automobile in mind, but also with the streetcar in mind. Now, in terms of the layout of the su subdivision themselves, notice these kind of circular drives. We're all very familiar with circular drives in subdivisions all across the United States today. The lots were fairly large. The idea of having circles and so forth was to slow down traffic and to make it a more pastoral, more kind of rustic, more country lane kind of feel to it. So if you think of older cities like Cincinnati, Covington and Newport, they were developed on a grid fashion. And by a grid, we mean they were usually squares or rectangles and uh, you know, first street, second street, third street, et cetera, in Covington running from east to west and then other um, you know, uh, perpendicular to that streets running north and south, you know, streets like Garrett and Greenup and Madison and Scott, et cetera. That kind of city that Covington and Newport uh, were, they were designed really as walking cities. People in the 1800s basically did not own, have access to their own transportation if they lived in cities. Oh, they might have a horse if they were fortunate enough and, and um, you know, wealthy enough to have a horse, maybe a couple horses, carriage, whatever. But for the average person, uh, they would not have necessarily had those things. They would have walked nearly everywhere or taken streetcars nearly everywhere. And so Covington, Cincinnati, and Newport were compact cities. They were walkable cities. They're what urban historians called walking cities. Park Hills, on the other hand, showed that it was being developed for the automobile in mind. These curvilinear kind of streets, these large lots, and in many instances, the houses had garages usually single car garages because a family would have been lucky enough to have one automobile back then. 
but sometimes they would have been double car garages. Sometimes they would have been at the back of the lot on side of the home. Sometimes later on, they were more and more incorporated in the house itself. They could have been alongside the house in the back of the house, as you'll see very often in Park Hills. So that shows you a little bit about how they certainly were reacting to the modern times. Now, if any of you are familiar, there's a wonderful resource that is available through the US Library of Congress. That's all you really have to do is Google US Library of Congress, Sanborn Maps, Covington. And there are a whole series of maps that were done by insurance companies. And the reason why the insurance companies had these maps, by the way, largely came out of the Chicago fire of the 1870s. Uh, one thing that happened in the Chicago fire, you know, when an entire city burns down, it's problematic, especially if most of the insurance companies insuring the property were from, say, for instance, Chicago. That would be a terrible loss. A lot of insurance companies went out of business. So after that, there was really a push to have insurance companies from all over the United States underwriting insurance policies for houses. So in other words, the idea was you might go to your local insurance company and say, I have a house in Park Hills. And they said, great. And it's worth such amount of money and you need to pay these sort of payments on an annual basis and we'll insure your house. But then they usually went to larger national insurance companies, and they wouldn't say just go to companies that were located in Cincinnati. They spread the risk all over the country. And the purpose for that was so that if anything ever happened to in one city, such as the Chicago fire again, that a single or a group of insurance companies wouldn't literally be bankrupted by that. The risk would be shared by people across, uh, by insurers across the country. Mm -hmm. Now to make that happen, those big insurers needed access to information about the cities and about the properties in the cities. So for all of you who are interested in architecture or family history, genealogy, the Sanborn maps are a literal treasure trove of information. They'll tell you whether at a particular point in time, a house was on a property. So if you wanna say, hey, I don't know when this house was built, well, at least the Sanborn maps will give you an idea of, was it there by that time? And if it was, what did it look like? What was its basic outline? Was it brick as shown in pink? Or was it uh, you know, a concrete kind of form building? shown in blue or was it a frame building more or less shown in yellow and then they'd even show where chimneys were and everything else and of course insurance companies were also looking for something else do you live right next door to a dynamite factory do you live right next door to a fireworks factory how about a lumber yard because if you do guess what your insurance rates are going to be much much higher than someone living next to, say, a candy store. Part of the reason for zoning in the United States was to make cities more attractive. Cities like Covington by this time had become not so attractive, not so pleasant. There could be a factory that pops up around the corner from your house, and maybe it's spewing forth all kinds of coal smoke and pollution. And so people wanted to get out of the cities. Covington would enact, by the way, a major planning and zoning commission of which DC Collins would be the chair. But people also wanted to get into new communities, new beautifully planned and executed communities where they had, look at this, big giant yards where children could play in, where Parents could have gardens and could enjoy cutting their grass on weekends. And now all of you should be 
saying, what? I hate to cut my grass on weekends, right? These were people actually that looked forward to those kinds of things. They didn't have big yards before. And the idea of working out in, in, in with nature and planting flowers and trimming bushes and cutting grass was something new and really exciting for them. Plus, they would have a place to park their car other than out on the street. They would have a garage to do that in. And best of all, remember what I said before, home and convenience. It was not only going to be homey and attractive and pleasant and rustic and they'd have yards, but it would be convenient because Park Hills was literally the closest suburb really to Covington. It was so close and it was connected to Covington by fantastic transportation systems, including the streetcar route. Lee and Simmons Development Company realized really they knew who their buyers were going to be. They were going to be middle class people and upper class people. And by the way, there were parts of Park Hills for the upper class and parts for the kind of the middle class. They knew that they needed both to make this place successful. And they also knew that what their customers wanted people who would buy lots and build homes was proximity and beauty, beautiful planning and access to transportation. Yes, they would have maybe one car each, but for the rest of the family, and that would generally be for the father. So the father could get in his car in the morning and commute to downtown Cincinnati, Covington or Newport for his job. For women, many of whom were homemakers, and for children, the streetcar route provided wonderful transportation opportunities. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that as well. There were a number of places where the trolley stopped. And at those trolley stops, the Lee and Simmons Development Company built these beautiful little trolley stops. And they made them quite attractive. They were made out of stone. They had like this one did originally a tile roof. It no longer does. And so when the streetcar came through, and this was the route of the streetcar, the streetcar came up Amsterdam Road on the one side of Amsterdam Road, which has now been um, filled in. That's the reason why Amsterdam Road used to be to Covington. Um, two different parts. One part was the trolley route and the other part was the car route. The, the part remaining is the car route. The part that was just covered up and closed was the streetcar route. The streetcar route then proceeded along. So this is Park Road and this is Amsterdam Road and this is down by um, uh, the, the church. And this is a little trolley stop. It proceeded right straight through here in the back of these houses along a tro trolley route that eventually would have made its way to Sleepy Hollow Road. So it also had a stop on Altavia Avenue. And it would have made its way to Am or Sleepy Hollow Road, at which point it went over a um, it went over a trestle and it curved around and went up current. Park Road and Fort Wright, and then eventually it would join up right around near, um, right before the what is now the uh, Kroger, and right around the, what is it a Mercedes dealership there? It joined up and went along the highway out to the end of the Fort Mitchell line. So, what else did they build? They not only built these nice, attractive trolley stops where you could go and keep out of the rain and the snow and out of the sun, but they also built public sidewalks and public steps to reach the trolley stops so that you didn't have to go all the way around the block to do so. This one that I'm showing you here goes from um, Old State Road in Park Hills, close to St. James Avenue, 
down to Amsterdam Road. And people could have taken this and walked here so that they could catch, if they want, the trolley at Altavia Avenue. Here's another example. So here actually I have a photo of that beautiful tile roof that used to be on the trolley um, stop. And this is of course now uh, used to be a Lutheran church, Gloria, Gloria Day Lutheran. And now it's um, Our Lady of Lords Catholic Church. Right behind Our Lady of Lords Catholic Church going up the hillside to Old State Road are some of these public steps. So again, people up here, instead of having to go all the way around and down Terrace and all the way Amsterdam Road could go right on down and catch the trolley at the trolley stop. Now this was a, this was really a great incentive and one of the things that they marketed. They marketed the Fort Mitchell car line. So the Fort Mitchell streetcar so-called because its terminus, its end was in Fort Mitchell. It ran through Park Hills and it could be caught at a couple of different locations. And it ran, you know, way into the night. It ran regular, uh, uh, you know, on a regular schedule. In fact, it, 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 there were lots of streetcars going back and forth. And I wanna tell you a little story about how that was convenient. In the 1940s, right during World War II, my grandfather Tenkati moved his family out to Barrington Woods, one of those subdivisions that had been developed by D. Collins Lee. And so they lived out on what is now Park uh, Road and uh, which used to be called Barrington Road in Lookout Heights. And my dad was still a kid in elementary school. And he attended St. John's Catholic School on Pike Street in the Lewisburg neighborhood in Covington. And back in those days, schools generally didn't have cafeterias. And so that's because all the kids lived close by and they could go home for lunch. Well, think of dad. He couldn't walk home for lunch. He had to walk all the way out to what is now Fort Wright Why he'd never get back in time. So he's caught the streetcar. The streetcar would go out and drop him off. And then it would drop the Crumpleman kid off. Now Crumpleman's lived on a farm right next to St. John's Cemetery on St. John's Road. And by the time that the streetcar um, dropped him off. He would go ahead. His mother would have his lunch ready. He would eat his lunch, go to the bathroom. The streetcar would be on its way back again, and he would catch the same streetcar back to Dixie Highway, Pike Street in Covington. So, I mean, literally, it was a thing that could happen in 30 minutes or so. You leave St. John's you're on a streetcar, you get dropped off at your house, you get lunch, go to the bathroom and get back on the streetcar as it's returning. They also advertised um, Park Hills, 10 homes now under construction. This is 1924. Water mains have just been completed. Drive out Sunday to see the most beautiful building sites ever opened in this country. Well, there's a little hyperbola, right? And it's not that I ever opened in this country. Well, try to support that, right? Uh, but it was a beautiful, they were beautiful and well-planned sites. Now, the Lee and Simmons Development Company got Covington to agree to let them tie into Covington's water, sewer, and gas lines. Now, the people had to pay for the water and sewage and gas, the natural gas. And Covington welcomed the fact that they were getting more, well, water and sewer was Covington, the gas lines weren't. Um, and so they welcomed that fact. But this is also something else that you need to keep in mind. Covington in essence allowed Park Hills and other places 
to tie in to its water and sewer lines. So it sort of gave away a bit of the shop here. And later on, when Covington would try in the 1950s and 60s to annex the suburbs, the suburbs would come back with the retort, well, why, what benefits do we have joining Covington? By that time, as I said, they had sold off most of their assets in one way or another by allowing people to tie in to their water and, and sewer lines. The Lee and Simmons Development Company did a lot of advertising, a lot of advertising in the Northern Kentucky papers, especially the Kentucky Post, but also what was then the Kentucky Time Star. And when you arrived out at that trolley stop near what is now Our Lady of Lords Church, this would have been greeting you, a big sign that said Park Hills, right, in big letters, and this little tiny building in between, which would have had the people at the Lee and Simmons Development Company with all their blueprints ready to sell you a lot in the city of Park Hills. Now, let me explain one thing. Back in those days, you'd buy a lot. They didn't have giant construction and subdivision development companies like Dree's company. So you were buying a lot and it basically was your responsibility to find a builder. And if you were upper class and you were building on one of the larger lots in Park Hills, you couldn't be outdone by the Joneses. You had to go get yourself a good quality credentialed architect who would build you basically a custom home. Now, most of the styles that you're going to see, architectural styles of homes in Park Hills, were the kinds of things that you would see across the nation. And yes, the architects were drawing upon those. But this meant that for the most part, the houses in Park Hills were all very individual, individualistic. So they weren't cookie cutter houses, like the cookie cutter ticky tacky house we grew up in and my dad admitted we grew up in. They were houses from the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s that were constructed and they were not constructed by a big major company. They were people's own styles and, and they reflected people's own taste. Now notice they also came up with a brochure to advertise. And they said it was the city of Park Hills, Kentucky's most beautiful city within two miles of the Dixie Terminal building. The Dixie Terminal building still exists in downtown Cincinnati, and it is on 4th Street, and the back end of it, which was on 3rd Street, had ramps. And so the streetcars would go over the, the suspension bridge, the Roebling Bridge, and they would enter into the Dixie Terminal, and you could get off and also catch a streetcar in all kinds of weather, rain, snow, sleet, hot, damp, cold, and you would be indoors and safe. Uh, the Dixie Terminal was constructed, especially <laughs> that part for that uh, part of the building. So by 1927, already the city of Park Hills was boasting that it had a population of 825, and it was adjoining Davu Fields Golf Course, Covington Tennis Club, and a 500-acre park with splendid, splendid car service, they mean streetcar service, to the finest streetcar company, uh, car terminal in the world. An exclusive community of fine schools with high altitude and new schools. That, um, that uh, Lee and Simmons Development Company brochure featured a lot of interesting photos that show some of the early homes. This one, for instance, is a, one of six beautiful homes along 
uh, they were kind of the model homes for the subdivision. And this was uh, along the, um, it, and it still exists uh, along uh, Park Road to the entrance. This also one, uh, one is, is along uh, the entrance as, as this one is as well. And these architect designed homes are, are really fabulous historical treasures. And one of them today is owned by my good uh, friend and colleague who uh, co-edited the Encyclopedia of Northern Kentucky with me in Gateway City, Covington, Kentucky, 1815 to 2015. And he owns this home, Jim Claypool. And instead of zoning regulations, the thing about new subdivisions like Park Hills is they managed what you could and could not build and how far you could build away from the street and whether or not you could have chickens or cows or anything like that, or whether you could have fences or no fences. All of that was regulated in the deed itself. Now, this deed I noticed said that said lot shall be used for residential purposes only and no business of any kind to be conducted there. It said any house erected thereon shall face park drive and the front, including porch, shall not be less than 40 feet back from the front of the property. And no house shall be erected on the property for less than $12,000. That was a lot of money back in the 1920s for a house. And they said that there was a right of way be behind these for utility lines and the like. So if you notice one thing about Park Hills, you don't notice that the houses like one is five feet from the road and one is 40 foot, and one's 25 foot, like this, you know, crooked teeth kind of deal that you would see in cities sometimes. They were all supposed to have the same, they called them, setbacks. They were to be set back a certain number of feet from the street. Furthermore, you were not supposed to have any fences in the front yard. And except for a couple of places in Park Hills that were literally grandfathered because they were there before the subdivision was, you will see no fences in the front yard. You will see fences in the front yard along an older part of Park Hills, uh, along Old State Road, where part of that subdivision there dated actually from the 1800s and hence predated the Park Hills Lee and Simmons Development Company. Here is a wonderful photograph that Pam Spore so generously uh, gave us showing the home, uh, and it's her home now, of J.M. Eberhardt at Cleveland Avenue and Jackson Road, right about 1927, when that brochure was published. And this is, of course, the home today. And uh, you can see one of the prized possessions of the family was this automobile. To have such a beautiful home and such a beautiful automobile, why it was definitely worth taking that photograph and allowing everybody to see what you owned. Now, the end, the part of Park Hills that was down near, in fact, they built a model home or two, and then some of those other beautiful homes were architect design homes all along Park Road. But what about the middle class? because not everyone could afford to get an architect to build a giant house made of stone and brick, et cetera. And so the Kentucky Post, the area newspaper, worked with Lee and Simmons Development Company to kind of make come true the idea of owning your own home if you were middle class. So the Kentucky Post announced that it was going to build what they called happy homes. And they said they were gonna build up to 
50 happy homes in Park Hills. And they worked with a contractor to do that. And I know that like four or five of these happy homes were built and you'll find most of them on Terrace Avenue, including this one at the corner of Terrace and Old State. It was one of the happy homes. They were like ranch homes. Some of them had kind of a stucco on the outside. So they kind of had this sort of southwestern sort of flair to them. And um, they had tile roofs as, as this one did. Uh, there's an, another couple of these down on Terrace. One of them was demolished uh, a few years back. So there were areas that uh, were, were also more specific to people of the middle class because the lots were smaller, the homes would be smaller. So what happened? Well, it all crashed and the stock market crash of Black Tuesday, October 29th, 1929, when of course the country, the nation, and much of the world entered what we call the Great Depression. For all intents and purposes, very few homes were built in the 1930s and also during the war years. And then during World War II, there was actually uh, you were not allowed, the federal government basically said that resources are scarce. We need all the resources we can for our military abroad, for fighting the war, for fighting and winning World War II. So construction, except of, uh, you know, large industries, factories that would aid in the war effort, or, you know, if you could really prove that you needed, you know, a school or this and that, construction for the most part went on a hiatus. So by the end of World War II, not only was there a new baby boom that would emerge when all of the veterans came back and started to have families and but there was also a pent up demand, not only because of World War II, but also because of the depression for new suburban housing. So you'll see Park Hills go through a second phase of building and prosperity, which really occurred in the 1940s and the 1950s and saw some development even of apartments in the city, saw the development more and more of the uh, other side of the Dixie Highway, the side of Mount Allen, et cetera, and saw kind of the edges of the city being filled in. By the 1960s, really by 1960 for the most part, um, the city had largely been built up. Now that was the residential part of the city. Along the Dixie Highway, Park Hills was known for something else, for being part of what was called the Gourmet Strip. And by the Gourmet Strip, there were lots of restaurants along the Dixie Highway that catered to people who wanted to have a good meal and perhaps also play the slot machines and maybe do even a little bit more in terms of gambling. Um, Kenton County and Campbell County uh, by the 1950s were wide open in terms of gambling. And um, so these things were not uncommon. We're showing here along the Dixie Gourmet Strip, um, Marshall's, which was a restaurant here. It was more of a, of uh, regular meals, nothing too fancy. And then there was also a bakery in this building called the Colonial Bake Shop, which catered to travelers. Because think, before 1963, there was no interstate through the area. So travelers all used coming through this area. Many of them used the Dixie Highway. So this was open 24 hours a day years ago to cater and give, uh, you could buy bakery goods and stop to buy coffee if you were tired. 
Then there was also the White House Tavern, which was opened in 1936 during the middle of the Depression, operated by Ben Castleman. It was known for its fine kind of Southern dining and its gambling. Um, and it was destroyed by fire in 1972 and never rebuilt. Still there today, um, it's the Sichuan Gardens, which used to be called the Golden Goose. This was an advertisement from the Golden Goose in 1967. And again, all of these places would have had some gambling going on. And then right where Chuck McHale's The Gardens of Park Hills are, was originally the Blue Star Tavern, also opened in the midst of the Great Depression in 1936. Owned by the Wooten family, it was later renamed Town and Country. This photo shows it circa the 1940s. And this one shows some postcard views, uh, tripartite of postcard of Town and Country about 1955. And then there was a little grill that, you know, you could get sandwiches, short orders, cold beer. Um, this, this was advertising here in 1939, the weekend special, a turkey dinner, including dessert for 55 cents. And this is where Baroni's now is. You can see uh, here was actually an old windmill and it was electronic and it went around and around. And there was a little store there when I was growing up, uh, the windmill and so forth was later on uh, moved. All of that would change in the 1970s and the 1980s as these businesses, many of them burnt down, had a number of fires, maybe rebuilt. But by that time, gambling had already uh, ended and people were already moving out. Um, you know, the height of, of kind of uh, Park Hills population would be in the 1970s. And then slowly the community became older and would lose population. Today it's experiencing in certain areas kind of a renaissance, right? As some areas of the city are being built up once again with some very new and very kind of customized and beautiful and expensive homes. The Park Hills that I grew up in was a Park Hills of, I will nostalgically say, well, of that has passed away, passed by as all of America of the 1960s and 1970s has. It was a place where people knew one another. There weren't many people moving in and out. Families stayed for years. They went to the same schools. They knew one another. They went to the same churches. They had porches. They rode bikes. They rode scooters. And they were, like I said in my little tease, time periods that some of you may remember from your own youth, if you're as old as me or older. And that is where kids would go out to play after school and wouldn't return home until they heard their parents their mother or father, whoever had the loudest voice, the days before cell phones, screaming down the street, Paul, supper, right? And we called it supper, by the way, not dinner. So uh, supper is a kind of a very Southern term, actually, for what the rest of the nation likes to call uh, uh, dinner. So basically, that is where I end because we can always do a round two sequel. What we are looking for are photographs and stories to share as we quickly approach the centennial of Park Hills as a city in 2027. And we want to do a series of articles in our rich history, which will then be hopefully turned into a book. And we're in desperate need of photographs and stories. So uh, I will now turn this over to questions. Hello. Um, I am Kim. I'm from Beringer Crawford Museum. Can you guys all hear me? Um, okay. 
Um, Paul Tenkati, can you hear what I'm saying? Oh, I can indeed. Awesome. Heather um, just called me. Um, her sound went out on her computer and to fix it, she has to restart everything. So she sent me the question that came in. She said, there's only been one. Um, it says, what about the lookout house? Oh, the lookout house, yes. The lookout house um, was up further on the Dixie Highway, directly across from where Sleepy Hollow Road is and St. Agnes Church. So that was actually in um, Lookout. Just... It was actually in Lookout Heights, Kentucky, what is now Fort Wright. So it was just outside the city limits of Park Hills. It was a um, next to the Beverly Hills. It was a um, wonderful posh gambling club controlled for years and years by a um, mob figure called Jimmy Brink. And um, then Jimmy Brink died in a very mysterious plane crash. And um, the uh, Cleveland syndicate uh, took it over completely by that point in time. Um, just to kind of give you a general idea of how widespread all of the gambling and all of the political connections were behind that. My dad was a very early member, a young person, uh, probably in his 20s then, very early member of the Lookout Heights Civic Club. And he was approached by Jimmy Brink to run for city council of Lookout Heights. And he refused because he, he knew what everybody knew what Jimmy Brink was up to. And why that may have sounded like a wonderful opportunity to begin and uh, to uh, gravitate a, um, uh, a career in, in politics, which could have been in those days uh, quite worthwhile economically. Um, it would be it would be a, 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 a bet uh, selling your soul to the devil, and he knew that, so he turned it down. But uh, to say that the cities like Lookout Heights were kind of in the pockets of of these gamblers, or looked the other way, or didn't have their own police forces, and so had to depend upon as Lookout Heights did and as Park Hills had to for a while, Kenton County Sheriff to step in and, and the Kenton County Sheriff wasn't really going to do that. And again, I'm hearing stories firsthand from folks who had clubs and businesses. And, you know, whenever say the state police was hoping to make a raid or when the Kenton County police had to make a raid. They had to sometimes make raids, you know, to show that they were doing their jobs and that they weren't completely in cahoots. Um, they usually preceded those raids with a telephone call and said, we'll be, we'll be raiding such and such a club on Saturday at such and such a time. And amazingly, whenever they did the raids, not whenever, most of the time they did the raids, they never found any gambling paraphernalia. Uh, the one club was a very small little bar, a ma and pop kind of operation. And they would get the, they would get the telephone call in and then they had secret hiding places in the basement and, 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 and other areas to put all the gambling paraphernalia away. Then once the raids were over, it would all come out again. <laughs> okay. Uh, we do have another question. When was the Civic Club and the police and fire department formed? You know, that is a good question. I should know the answer to that. And I should have done my homework and looked at the wonderful entry that Iris Spore uh, wrote for us on Park Hills in the Encyclopedia of Northern Kentucky. But I'm actually happy that I don't know the answer to that because now we can drive traffic to the Encyclopedia of Northern Kentucky. <laughs> and, and no, you, you really, you can get copies of it like on eBay, but you'll pay a fortune. So I'm gonna tell you a good tip. And that is the Cincinnati Enquirer 
bought the rights when we sold out the first edition, and I think they may have sold out the second edition to the Encyclopedia of Northern Kentucky, the University Press of Kentucky, which is nonprofit, sold the digital rights to the Enquirer. So they put it all online. It's all digital and it's all free. It's a little hard to find, but I'm going to tell you how to do it. Go to your favorite search engine, Bing, Google, or whatever, Firefox, and you type in in parentheses, not, not in parentheses, in, in uh, apostrophes, chapter. P, P for Park Hills, then put Encyclopedia of Northern Kentucky, hit enter, and it will take you to the P's. It's all alphabetical. And you will be able to open that thing up as large as you want, as large a screen as you have, and you can page through it, you know, like this. It just, the pages turn like that and you can read it. And so how about we all go look that up in Park Hills. It was later on. I want to say it was the 1930s that they actually got a, a volunteer fire department in there. Before that time, they were um, um, covered by Covington. Covington came out. In fact, uh, when my grandmother had a horrible accident, she was hit by a streetcar in the early 1940s and died. It was the Covington ambulance that came out to pick her up. Wow. So most of those communities did not, they paid Covington to cover their fire and their police. But I'm glad you brought that up because once they start getting their own departments, that's a couple of more reasons why they felt they didn't need to be annexed to the city anymore. So thank well, you for bringing that up. Great. Well, um, we did not have a winner for the uh, trivia question. So I thought maybe you might want to give everyone the answer. So um, whose farm immediately abutted Covington Catholic High School? It was Matthew Kramer, K-R-A-M-E-R. -E and you all may know the Kramer name if you like fine pastries, a fine deli. This sounds like an advertisement because the Kramer family also had a farm in Villa Hills, what is now Villa Hills, and they have a little store in Villa Hills. And uh, that Kramer family was related to Matthew Kramer, who uh, I don't believe had any children. He was single and he had that 90 or so acres right between St. James Avenue and um, Covenant Catholic, it was a very esoteric question, I guess, because um, as kids, we used to go over on his property and he'd get a little mad and come out after us sometime with, with armaments. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for everything. I want to let everyone know that um, Berenger Crawford Museum's big event, Fresh Art, is coming up September 18th. If you're interested, you can get your tickets on our website, bcmuseum.org. And right now our silent art auction is actually online and it's already started. So um, you can go to our website as well to find out how to um, start bidding on some of that silent art pieces now. So th thank you so much for everything um, and your presentation. And I've got Heather on the phone, so I want to make sure there isn't anything else that I'm supposed to be doing. Hey, Heather. Oh, okay. All right. Um, I'm also supposed to remind you that we're still doing our every other um, every other week installment of the Northern Kentucky History Hour. So there is not one next week, but the week after. All right, so thank you so much for, for um, joining us and thank you to um, Paul Tenkati for sharing all of your knowledge with us. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.